The views expressed on this show by guests and the host on issues outside of the 9-11 controlled demolition evidence are the opinions of those individuals alone and do not necessarily reflect those of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Welcome to another episode of 9-11 Free Fall. I am the host, Andy Steele, and today we're going to be talking with uh, Roland Angle, our chairman here at AE 9-11 Truth. Now, I don't know if it's going to run before or after this particular Free Fall episode, but at some point in this week, you're going to see him giving an awesome presentation on our new show called The Focus. Uh, so we bring on a panel of engineers. We're presenting on topics that are within the controlled demolition issue, but it zeroes in on a particular aspect, questions not before asked. So if it's not out yet, keep an eye out for that bulletin and Roland's presentation. If we have put it out already by the time you see this show, then certainly go to our YouTube channel and check it out. But who is this guy? Well, he's been on the show before. He is the chairman of AE 911 Truth. He graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, with a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering and also served in the U.S. Army Special Forces, where he was trained in the use of explosives. That's very pertinent to our issue. He became a licensed civil engineer in California, and his 50 years of engineering experience has included designing and testing blast-hardened missile launch facilities and designing U.S. Naval explosive containers, harbor terminal facilities, earth foundation systems, and hydraulic systems. Uh, he's owned three different construction companies, and he's taught engineering subjects to high school students. And, of course, he heads up AE 911 Truth's project, Due Diligence, which we'll be talking a little bit about today. It's getting engineers out into the grassroots of the engineering community, also out into like local citizens groups as well, talking about uh, the World Trade Center evidence, the, uh, the points clearly uh, showing that these buildings were brought down with explosives, Along with that, Roland has a book that is going to be coming out. We announced it earlier this week. So let's just go ahead and bring him in. He'll be talking about that today. Roland, welcome back to 9-11 Freefall. Thanks for having me back, Andy. Always good to be here. Yeah, and it's great having you here. You're doing a lot of work, and it's, it's work that when we see the fruit of it, we talk about it, but a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes, people don't get to see. So I love to be able to highlight the uh, the heroes here that don't always get out into the spotlight and don't really seek it. Um, but we wouldn't have this project due diligence going on if you hadn't stepped up and really uh, put all of this together, had the idea and uh, devised it. And you work with a lot of engineer volunteers in doing that. Um, you know, we're probably picking up new people don't know what the heck I'm talking about when I say project due diligence. So just briefly remind our audience what that is, what those engineers are doing, and essentially what it's all about. Project due diligence is our attempt to educate our fellow engineers, particularly the structural and civil engineers, in regards to the evidence that we have uncovered regarding the failure of the three high-rise buildings at World Trade Center in New York City on 9-11. We have examined the reports that were issued by the National Institute of Standards and Technology on the Twin Towers in 2005 and on the Building 7 in 2008, as they were required to do by the law that was passed by Congress in October of 2002, more than a year after the event, tasking them with the, with the job of investigating the collapse of the buildings and coming up with the reasons why the buildings collapsed. So we started reading those reports as architects and engineers individually back in 2005 when the first one came out. By 2006, it was already evident that 
the report on the Twin Towers was seriously flawed. And we knew that because it never did explain what it was supposed to explain, which is why and how the buildings collapsed. It was a 13,000 page document that ended at the beginning of the initiation of the collapse of the building. And they explained the collapse of the building with three words, global collapse ensued. And that was their total technical explanation for how that building came down. Well, that's not what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to give us a, a model, uh, an analysis, and a reason why that building came down, both of them, in the, way, in the manner in which they did, which was in about 10 seconds. And that was a totally unexpected event. Everyone in the world was shocked by what they saw that day. And it was our engineering expertise that was called upon to explain why and how that happened. And that report utterly failed to even address the question. It went into the plane impacts, it went into the fires, it went into the structural damage due to the plane impacts, the damage caused by the fires. But once the collapse began, the narrative left off and didn't give us any explanation for why the entire lower parts of the building collapsed. So in 2006, an architect in the East Bay, Richard Gage, began to question the, this report. And he began to make appearances to his fellow architects, to engineers, to the general public, to anyone who would listen. And I attended one of those performances back in 2007 or so, right around there. And he made a great deal of sense. He made a good argument that the report on the Twin Towers actually raised more questions than it answered. So he had a petition there that people could sign asking for a new investigation. And he had one for architects and engineers as experts in the field. I signed that petition. And a couple of years later, the report on Building 7 came out. And it took several years to analyze that report. We did get the details of a collapse mechanism in that report that NIST compiled. But the as we began to look into their what they called a progressive collapse theory, the details of the report indicated that there were decisions made that did not follow the evidence and did not give a scientific explanation for why the building came down that made any sense. So we simply added building seven on to our questions about the Twin Towers. And in the meantime, Richard had founded the Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth that we are currently operating within. And the organization since then has grown and involved literally thousands of people, more than 3,500, 3,600 architects and engineers have since signed the petition calling for a new investigation. I think more than 30,000 lay persons have signed that petition. We presented it to our Congress people and to NIST, and we've made every attempt to get the engineering community to look at this event with new eyes. And we have met with a lot of resistance. So when I came on the board in 2017, I believe it was, uh, I was asked if I would oversee an outreach to the engineering community. Under Richard, they had focused on the architectural community and they had gone to the national conventions of the American Institute of Architects for three years in a row and raised a proposition at the conventions calling for a new investigation and asking for the AIA to endorse that request. And the AIA refused. They, the, the vote in favor of that never got more than about 10 or 11% of the attendees. 
So my impression of that was that the architects didn't want to get out in front of the engineers. This was really not an architectural failure. Architects, of course, and engineers work together to design and build structures of this nature. But architects, th that's not their bailiwick. They're not going to go into the structural details of a, of a collapse of this nature. And I could understand their reluctance to preempt the engineering community when it was really an engineering problem. So I propose that we start a project uh, called Project Due Diligence to take the information that we had put together, our analysis of the NIST reports and the FEMA report before it, and take it out to the engineering community because it was clear that the leadership of our professional organizations did not want to have this discussion with their members. And that was made clear to us by their attitude when we approached them and said, listen, we've got this information. We think it's important for our community. We'd like to make presentations at your conference. We'd like a, a venue so that we can have this discussion and everyone in our profession can benefit from it. That wasn't happening. So we took on the approach of instead of going to the leadership, we decided to go to the membership at the grassroots level. And we focused on the American Society of Civil Engineers because that organization is the big gorilla on the block in the profession. They've been around since 1857. They have an established reputation of looking out for the interest of our profession. And in fact, when I was in college, I joined their honor society, Chi Epsilon, because it was an organization that said that it was going to promote the ethical and professional interests of the, of the profession. And I thought that was a good thing to do. Well, so in to Tony Zambodi and I put together a PowerPoint based upon a lot of other information that had been collected by Richard and others before him. And we started taking that information out. Then I went, oh, I took the, uh, the petition signers that the petition that I had signed, we had the record of everyone that had signed that since. At that time, there was something like a thousand signatures there. And I went through there with the help of the staff and we selected the civil and structural engineers that had signed. And I began calling them up and asking them if they were interested in an effort to take this information that we had compiled out to the rank and file branches of the American Society of Civil Engineers all across the country, of which there are about 161 local branches. So I was successful in recruiting about 40 engineers that said that they would be glad to do that. They, they thought that that was an important thing to do and they would, they volunteered to learn the material and to make presentations in their area if the opportunity arose. So we got that information out to them. We had some training. We went through the information. We felt satisfied that it made sense. And we began reaching out in 2018 to the local chapters of ASCE. And what we found was that wherever we made these presentations, wherever we got accepted, and then we went out and we made the presentations, we found that the engineers that were in attendance were 100% in agreement with us that the NIST reports did not meet our professional standards. They, they had a lot of anomalies, a lot of omissions, a lot of problems with those reports that we felt needed to be addressed. And we asked them if they felt the same way after we made our presentations, we always got 100% agreement. So in the course of the last four or five years, we've made that presentation to more than a thousand engineers at the grassroots level all across the country, everywhere from Florida to Alaska, to the New York area, to California, the Southwest, the Southeast, the Midwest, everywhere we've gone, we're getting 100% agreement from the rank and file that 
the issues that we've raised need to be addressed. And yet we have come across extremely recalcitrant leadership that insists upon branding us as conspiracy theorists. And whenever they can, preventing us from making any kind of presentations to their chapters. And that has happened. We've been accepted and then later rejected more than 30 times in the last four years. And we've managed to make 50 presentations, many of them to ASE chapters, but also to the National Society of Professional Engineers and some other engineering organizations and some public presentations as well. So that's what Project Due Diligence is all about. And the book that I'm putting together is, this is not my information. This is information that's been collected by all those volunteers and by all the researchers that went through the reports and came up with the anomalies that were able to, we were able to put together in a coherent uh, strategy, a, a coherent explanation of what we thought went wrong with the ex with the um, reports. So that's Project Due Diligence. That's what the book is about. I'm not taking credit for it myself. This has been a huge effort over many years, and we now need to make a report to the profession and to the public that explains what the process has been, what our findings have been, what the reaction has been, and we've gone a little further and identified a lot of the engineers that were involved in the preparation of the NIST reports, the FEMA reports, and all the periphery people, the contractors, the academics, all the people that had anything to do with this question, we have tried to identify them and we call them persons of interest because we believe that somewhere in that group of people are persons who were somehow coerced into making decisions that were not consistent with our professional standards that justified the official narrative. And that narrative is what is currently being bolstered by our professional organizations. And there's really no basis in reality for it. And we're unable to get them to engage in a dialogue. So the book is our next step. You know, I, I consider it sort of the uh, ignition test for uh, these professional organizations. And, and what do I mean by that? Like, let's just going back to the nanothermite uh, uh, evidence, you know, when they actually do ignition tests to actually get the thermitic reaction um, on those uh, on the, on the samples there. And sometimes you have to test what you're up against just to see the reaction that they give you. For instance, when we did the C-SPAN campaign, the defensive and ridiculous answers from politicians was outlined by somebody in a video saying, you know, we've got a major problem here because asking them these direct questions about this evidence uh, brought this out of them and showed where the real problem is. And so through Project Due Diligence, by going to try to give these presentations, you're basically testing uh, these professional organizations. And I don't know if that's, it was the main motive when you started, but that's what it's turning into. And we're seeing the resistance here because if there is nothing to what we're saying, <clears throat> then they should be able to debunk it. They don't debunk it or to have some kind of open dialogue. If they think it's just a ridiculous conspiracy theory, what better opportunity is there to try to shoot holes in it, take it down <clears throat> and show it for what it is, but they won't do that either because they can't argue with it. So now their only recourse is to try to cancel presentations, get ahead of them, do the politicking behind the scenes. Um, and I don't want to get into too much details about some of the things that our engineers are going through, but there is a lot of pressure on these engineers to maintain the status quo, to not rock the boat, and to not bring up this issue at all. Um, so kind of going into some of uh, what I perceive uh, are going to be some of the themes in your upcoming book, Roland, what skin does organizations like the ASCE and the other professional organizations have in this game? I mean, if, if the NIST reports are wrong, seemingly they should want to be the heroes for taking the 
first step towards spotlighting that or at least acknowledging it and coming off as a um, unbiased and science first organization. So why do you think there's such a strong cover up there? It's pretty clear that the evidence shows that the analyses that NIST has come up with are wrong. We're, we're a thousand to nothing on that case from the rank and file. Unfortunately, the people that committed this crime also planned the cover up. You can, you can divide the crime into three sections, uh, the planning, the execution, and the cover up. Clearly, the people that committed the crime did not want to be held responsible for what they did. So the cover up involves planning a false narrative, creating some patsies that are going to take the fall, and then monitoring that cover up over time as time goes on to make sure that nobody deviates from that narrative and anybody that does is going to be punished. So we saw on the day of the event, there were multiple recordings and eyewitness reports of explosions in the buildings, overwhelmingly, some 40 plus, and almost every one of them, the talking head that was representing the interviews described and interviewed people that also described multiple explosions in the buildings. So the, you would think that the narrative that would follow from that naturally would be, we're going to investigate what could have possibly caused those explosions in the building. Instead, what you saw was a narrative that took over the very next day saying they had already identified the 19 hijackers. They knew who they were. We had their faces, we had their names and the, what must have caused the buildings to collapse was the airplane impacts and the fires that weakened the structure afterwards. And that's why the buildings collapsed. And that became the narrative from there on. And even NIST, when they compiled their reports, didn't even examine the evidence for evidence of explosives. And they admitted that. Very strange. Very strange. You have all these eyewitness reports. You have buildings that were previously the target of a terrorist attacks using explosives in 1993. And the fire code called for in collapses of this type, you would always check for incendiaries and explosives. They ignored the fire code. So these were all problems, problems for their narrative. And in order to get around that, they had devised a plan where they would work with the primary professional engineering organizations to provide the investigators and look into why the buildings collapsed with them. So FEMA and uh, FEMA took over the, the examination immediately upon the event, which is their job. They're supposed to be a federal emergency management agency. So they go in whenever there's an emergency. This was clearly an emergency that fell within their purview. And they went in and they were supposed to be the ones that uh, sort of made an initial assessment and then came up with a plan for whatever needed to be done to further the investigation, take whatever remedial action was necessary. So it took a year and a month, October the 1st, 2002, for Congress to act to pass a law that specifically designated the National Institute of Standards and Technology as the agency that was going to conduct those investigations. So in the intervening years, in the intervening months, 19, uh, from September of 2001 to October of 2002, most of the evidence was destroyed. They picked up all the steel, the debris, they destroyed it. They sent the steel off to China for recycling. Nobody seemed to be able to stop them, even though there were many people on the scene that realized that they were destroying evidence that was 
going to be necessary in order to conduct a forensic examination of what had happened. But at any rate, NIST was designated as the agency to provide the investigations in October of 2002. And they took that, they took that uh, responsibility up. But there's a lot of evidence that they shouldn't have because they were not immune from the kind of pressures that was going to be brought on them to uh, alter the events and save face for people that might have been responsible because the executive branch of the government was responsible for protecting us that day and they failed to do so. And this is uh, part of the Department of Commerce, which is also an executive arm of the government. So essentially you had a case where you were asking the executive branch of the government to examine the executive branch of the government and the executive branch of the government was a party to the event. So that was the, the director of NIST should have declined that directive from Congress and cited a conflict of interest, which was actually in the law. He could have referred to the law that they had just passed and said, I can't do this. We have a conflict of interest but they pursued it and then they went out and hired subcontractors to do a lot of the work do a lot of the analysis gathering of the evidence what was left and so on so that presents the problem that we're faced with which is that the big mucky mucks in the professional engineers associations primarily from ASCE and the Structural Engineers Association were the ones that actually conducted the investigations and wrote many parts of the reports that NIST produced. So they have a vested interest. They are signatories to the original NIST reports, and it's going to be difficult for them to admit that the reports are not consistent with the evidence. So that was a, a a bit of genius on the part of the people that planned the crime. They knew that they were going to have to plan the cover up as well. And they did that by dragging in the luminaries of the engineering field, had them participate in the report and control the outlaw, the outcome of the reports by having people in strategic places that were able to pull the strings to make sure that the conclusions that they came to were not consistent with the evidence. Now, let me just be clear. I don't believe that anybody in the engineering field in any part of these organizations was a criminal that planned the crime. I think that they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they were somehow incentivized to make decisions in the process of those reports that weren't consistent with the evidence. And I'm quite sure that there's many of them that are aware of that. But when you're dealing with a criminal activity of this nature that plunged the whole world into world war, it can be quite intimidating. And I can understand that. I have compassion for these people. On the other hand, they are the ones that could possibly lead us to the perpetrators because somebody pulled their strings. Somebody told them, no, you're not going to make that decision. You're going to make this decision. And there are, we've identified 23 decisions in the process of all three of those reports that are not consistent with the evidence and don't make sense in the sense of the people that made them couldn't have possibly believed that that was true unless they were incompetent. And I can't believe that 23 separate decisions were made randomly all in favor of the alternative narrative that they had created and all dismissive of the notion that explosives could have brought the buildings down. So that's where we are. It's, it's politics. Politics, somebody within power had the ability to influence the leadership of our professional organizations in the engineering field. And we took the black eye because all three of those buildings came down due to what we call design loads. The two towers were designed to take a hit from a commercial airplane. And Building 7, which supposedly collapsed 
according to their narrative, due to normal office fires, had never occurred in the history of steel frame buildings. So when you have a failure of that magnitude, of any magnitude, really, that where the structure fails under a design load, something that was designed to withstand, then you have a problem. Something is wrong with your theory. There's something that you don't understand. Why didn't it hold up under the loads that you thought it would? So you have to investigate that. And that usually involves uh, an investigative team and then uh, an issue, issuing a report, having it peer reviewed by other organizations. And then there's a debate that goes back and forth about the findings. And over time, you narrow down the field of possibilities and you eventually come to the correct conclusion. And that's the practice. That's the engineering practice that's been going on for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So in this case, that whole process was derailed by the very organizations that had been involved in creating the reports in the first place, at least at the top levels. So that's a problem for us as engineers. We cannot allow that kind of misinformation to creep into the reality of our practice because it will only spread like a cancer. And we'll then begin really having problems with our designs and with our construction procedures because we have allowed ourselves to be conned by uh, an investigation that's not accurate and a, rel a reliance on a theory of failure that doesn't match the facts. That's right. And once you start letting science get infiltrated, muddied by politics, uh, by uh, just pre-designed stories that they wanted to cement in people's heads early on, once you allow that to happen and you keep on redrawing that line, uh, then it's hard to stop it from happening again in the future. All science gets politicized and then people start believing in something that has no scientific backing behind it whatsoever because you're already set down the precedent. Everything that happens in government and in our uh, society is all based on precedent. You know, you let people get away with one thing here, uh, then they can get away with something else even bigger in the future. And there definitely was a decision at some point, sometime, to not uh, look or take seriously the possibility that explosives were used in those towers. They were uh, they were throwing it out right from day one. In fact. I have a clip of Peter Jennings from ABC Nightly News the evening of September 11th. This is after Building 7 had already come down. He brings on an engineer, and I think it's somebody of some importance in the engineering community, uh, giving them his initial thoughts on why the buildings possibly came down. And I can't remember who that was off the top of my head. But at one point, Peter Jennings speculates, and he says, have we gotten a lock on why that third building come down? Uh, there. And you can see sort of like a little bit of suspicion in his eyes. And he asked the question, he said, do you think that possibly a structural engineer had some hand in the planning of this event? Um, and this is a really strange question to be asking, you know, after asking about World Trade Center 7. So even at that moment, you can sort of tell that Peter Jennings' mind was spinning a little bit, wondering how these buildings could have just come down from the airplane impacts. And in the case of Building 7, no airplane hitting it at all. And then, of course, I never heard him mention anything else about that afterwards. But they had to get ahead of this uh, as quickly as possible. And <clears throat> I believe that at some point, uh, the word had to be put forth that we are not going to consider the possibility that explosives were used. We're going to dismiss them outright. And that is part of the cover-up, whether willing or unwilling. You know, it's fascinating to see what happens sociologically, professionally, to contribute to cover-ups. Not everybody who participates in a cover-up really sees the, the full picture of it or even knows that they're in a cover-up, but that is all part of the cover-up. And uh, from my understanding, that's what some of your book is going to be getting into. Now, I just want to tell our audience the name of the book is Engineering the 9-11 Cover-Up, How the WTC Evidence Was Kept Secret from the World. If you uh, donate $35 to help us keep our operation going while we put this book together and do all the great stuff that PDD is doing, uh, you can get early access to the book. You get a, a, the chapters sent to your inbox every month, a nice little flip book uh, format that we've got uh, set up for this. <clears throat> you can send your commentary in. We certainly want to hear your suggestions and thoughts about it. And then, of course, there will be 
a final volume that goes out. Roland, what do you want the legacy of this book to be? What do you want people coming away with uh, when they read it and, and taking forward into the future with regard to this issue? Well, that's a good question. We feel strongly that our profession has been misrepresented. And we want to set the record straight. We may not have the political clout at this particular time to bring this information to the public in a way that has the kind of impact that it should have, because we don't control the media and we don't control the government agencies that were involved. But we can publish our findings and make it available to the public and to other members of our profession so they at least understand that there were some of us that understood that there was a real problem here. And we made every effort to bring it to the attention of our fellow colleagues and to the public at large so that we could come to a realistic and accurate appraisal of why those buildings failed, causing such great loss of life and becoming the event that was used to project foreign policy into the future for the next decades. So this is a major event. This is, this is not just a dam failure or a road failure or um, a minor failure. Uh, uh, I mean, not, not every, every failure is a failure. Some failures don't cost anybody their life, and that's a fortunate thing. There are other failures that do and cost maybe dozens of lives, but this failure resulted in the loss of something like 25, 27, 2,800 people in the buildings and in the planes and resulted in further loss of life because of the changes in direction that the foreign policy of the United States took after that. Hundreds of thousands, millions of people died as a result of those events. So we have a heavy burden. And as engineers, civil engineers and structural engineers, of course, we always have the foremost notion that the safety of the public is our number one priority. And in this case, the buildings came down under design loads that they were supposed to withstand. And we have to explain why. The government has issued reports. And when we look at those reports, we say those reports fail. They have too many anomalies, too many omissions, too many things that are unexplained. And there's an absolute refusal on the part of the authorities and the engineering profession leadership to have any discussion of this whatsoever. So that's very suspicious. As you say, if they had an answer for the questions that we raised, believe me, they would come forth with those answers and they would say, this is why you're wrong. That's the process that we normally go through. But to be met with silence, that's a telltale, that's a telltale event right there. If they don't want to discuss it, why not? Only because they don't have an answer. So we already have our answer. We know they're wrong. We know the reports are wrong. We know they were taken over by political forces that are outside of the field of engineering. But as engineers, we still have our duty. And our duty is to tell the truth as we understand it to the best of our ability for how those buildings failed. And that's what we're going to do. And we're going to make the record for, the, for history. And we know that history is going to exonerate us at some point. Things will have progressed on to the point where this becomes a, a historical event. And those people that are responsible for the cover up and the crime are long gone. Perhaps at that point, the truth will be able to emerge. But we don't want to wait that long. We think that there are still people around that were involved in the crime. And we're, we're going to make every attempt to bring them to justice with what we can do, which is through an ex, uh, a competent forensic examination of the evidence. So that's what we're going to do. And we're going to point out the people that were involved in those investigations. And we're hopefully some somebody among them will 
have the courage to come forward and give us more information about how exactly these strings were pulled and these decisions were made. Right. And we're also going to be sending this book uh, to engineers when we can, because engineers, like anybody in a profession, if they're really into what they do, they read about it. Right. Just like doctors read medical journals or read about some new development or a new disease coming out. Uh, They do it in their spare time. A lot of times Uh, engineers will do the same thing. They read about topics related to their profession. And certainly this is related to their profession. And it's, it's almost a a dark uh, story of what happened here, of what, what happened to try to perpetuate this official story, make people not even question it. And as Roland has pointed out, again, they don't even want to have the discussion. They, they go out of their way to try to stop the discussion from happening at all. Now, if we were just full of it and it was just putting out a wild conspiracy theory, they could easily dismiss that. They could talk about it right out in the open. The fact that they're trying to cover it up shows that they know they don't have a leg to stand on, but they have to still defend it in some kind of a way. Um, And, you know, what's interesting is there's so many people over the years, and I've been doing this a long time. When I first started out, debunkers would say, well, you only got however many architects and engineers we had at the time, maybe 1,500 or so. You know, how many architects and engineers are there in America and in the greater world even, right? Well, number one, the only people that are doing the work of trying to educate engineers on this topic is AE 9-11 Truth. Now, I think we do a pretty good job for the resources that we have, but, you know, we're not uh, we're not the ASCE. We're not uh, these professional organizations with the millions of dollars and manpower and resources to be able to get the the materials out there. So we have to do it one presentation at a time. Videos like this uh, is is how we do outreach. So we have to rely on our supporters to help us too and send that stuff out when they can. Send it to engineers that they know. Most engineers aren't even aware that a third tower fell on September 11th. Now, even to this day, even after all of this controversy and all of this discussion, they don't even have an opinion one way or the other about whether it was a controlled demolition because they don't know that World Trade Center 7 exists. And to me, that is a huge failure of these professional organizations, which are supposed to be leading the way for the engineering community, educating engineers, and they don't even talk about the worst... I mean. And again, just putting the whole issue of controlled demolition to the side for a moment. If you go with the official story, it's the worst structural failure in modern history. A few random office players can bring down a steel frame high rise in seven seconds. And most engineers don't ever hear about it from the ASCE. They're not uh, studying it repeatedly over and over again to keep it from happening anymore. They just kind of put out a story and then let it let it die. Just didn't want to talk about it anymore. Uh, what's your comment on that role and the fact that they haven't really like, done a good job of telling people about building seven and most engineers don't know about it. I think they don't want to discuss it because it's, they don't want to discuss it. In other words, they don't want to, they don't want to bring it up. They don't want people to be aware of it because then it's a very suspicious event. You've got a 47 story steel frame building that collapsed into its own footprint after some office fires in seven seconds. I mean, that's a remarkable event. In structural engineering history, it's a it's a one off. There's there's no other. It wasn't hit by planes. It had some minor debris damage, a few fires. And then. It collapsed seven hours later. So. It's not the kind of event that they want to discuss because uh, it, it, first of all, it piques the curiosity just to begin with once you understand the ramifications of the event. This is something that engineers should be all over. They should be all over this event. They want to understand it in minute detail. Instead, the story that we were given by NIST was that these routine office fires for the first and only time in history with no other significant event caused the collapse of a high-rise steel frame building. 
Well, we build buildings out of steel to the high rise capacity because we don't want them to collapse when they catch fire. That's why we do that. Now, here you have an event where the fires brought the building down in seven seconds. Had there been anybody in the building, they, of course, would have perished. But they had evacuated the building at the time when the first two towers were hit. And then they had and then some very suspicious events occurred. They said that there was no water to fight the fires. Well, that that's been proven to be false. There was plenty of water to fight the fires. They said that they knew the building was going to come down. How did they know that? No other building in similar circumstances had ever come down. So they, they quote some engineer that told the fire department that the building was going to fall down in a few hours. Gee, that was some remarkable information coming from an engineer who still is anonymous to this day. We have not found out if that person really existed or not. Who was it? How did some engineer on the scene perceive that the building was about to collapse? When the explanation that NIST gave for actually why it collapsed was a complicated series of Rube Goldberg progression of events where uh, some long beams were heated, pushed a girder off of its seat at a column, the floors collapsed, the column collapsed, it caused other columns to collapse, caused more columns to collapse, and then the whole thing came down at once. That is, frankly, unbelievable. So, when you, and when you look at the particular mechanics, every one of those events can be disproven and could not have happened. So, that's why they don't want to bring it up. That's why they don't want to discuss it. It's easier, and the only answer they have is to say, well, these guys are conspiracy theories, and we're practicing engineers. We're people that represent more than 50,000 years of engineering experience. And these are not people that are going to lightly throw away their reputation by signing a petition that they know is not going to be met uh, in a friendly manner from the establishment. These are people that know that when they sign that, they're going to be they're going to be castigated. They're going to be punished if possible. And many of them have. So, and we're not funded by anybody. There's nobody making money on this. This is not, we, we, we rely entirely on donations from our supporters to exist. Nobody's getting rich off of this. We paid the University of Alaska at Fairbanks Structural Engineering Department something like $325,000 that we had to raise from our supporters to come up with a peer reviewed report of the building seven report that NIST produced, couldn't reproduce it, said it wasn't possible. And the only way that the building could come down like that was to remove eight floors of columns simultaneously all throughout the building, which is a description of what happens in controlled demolition. So yeah, we've been, betrayed by our professional leadership. They have their reasons for doing so. They have connections with the federal government. They have contracts. They have prestigious positions. They have a lot to answer for. And unfortunately, I don't think we can rely on them to come forward spontaneously. They haven't done so in 21 years. So we're going to have to make the record and hope that at some point in the future, Sooner than later, we're going to get begin to get some answers about who was influenced, how they were influenced, and that trail can lead back up to the perpetrators. That's right. You know, and you tell, you mentioned about how our supporters funded the World Trade Center seven uh, study out of the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I want someday. When this is acknowledged, when this is out there in the open and get the proper prosecutions, I'm not pessimistic. I think it's going to happen. Uh, but I want I want those people who donated to that project to get some kind of tax break or whatever. Because if you think about it, like their tax money already went towards paying for the NIST reports. And what they got in return was a bunch of garbage. So they had to 
pay again just to get an accurate report out of the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And that's another thing. This is a reputable engineering school, prestigious one. And now you've got this report out of there that completely contradicts what NIST puts out. And these professional associations just act like, oh, well, whatever, you know, it's nothing. And just, uh, I mean, but that's a huge deal. Two different reports with two different conclusions. I mean, someone should sit down and rectify why they're coming out to these two different conclusions, but they have no interest in doing this. So we have to do the work of the government for them. And what we are doing is we're recreating the country. We're creating a new culture here uh, through AE 911 Truth, through the internet. And it's not just with this issue, but other issues as well. We are undermining the system. Nobody takes the mainstream media seriously anymore. Nobody takes the politicians seriously anymore. I don't think anybody even respects uh, the people in the White House, regardless of what party they're from or out there in Congress, they're just sort of there. They're just it's sort of like we're all kids in a school and nobody likes the principal. Um, so we're just all sort of doing whatever we can get away with here, as long as it's uh, ethical and, and good. But we're basically talking about these issues and bringing it out there on the Internet. And then they try to uh, ban us or, or mess with the algorithms. And I don't know how all of that specifically works, but to keep messages like this out there. And it's not going to work. People are wising up and they know that there's problems with things like September 11th. And I also like how you mentioned too about, oh, supposedly this engineer on the street that is uh, seeing that Building 7 is going to come down. And I mean, even BBC is predicting it 20 minutes before it happens, but it's an unprecedented event and everybody's evacuated from the building. And all of this is happening on the inside of the building, according to NAST. You know, these, uh, these beams pushing the girder off its seat is happening on the inside of the building. Nobody can see it yet. They're predicting that this is all going to come crashing down. It doesn't make sense on its face. Uh, so here we are over 20 years later, Roland. <clears throat> got a lot of problems going on in this country. Insane division among the political parties. We got inflation has just gone crazy. I mean, it's like $8 for a medium cup of ice cream at the Dairy Queen right now. That's how I measure inflation. Um, <clears throat> we've got, uh, I mean, the very... First time I've ever been nervous about nuclear war breaking out in my entire lifetime. A uh, lot of major issues going on, but here we are every week coming back to 9-11 free fall, talking about some buildings that came down back in 2001. I mean, what are we, crazy or something? With all this stuff going on, why are we focusing on this still and writing books about it? And not just doing the same show, but inventing new shows about it. Um, answer that question. Why do we need to keep on beating on this, even in spite of everything that is going on elsewhere in the world? Why does it all come back down to what happened to these buildings on 9-11? And how can that set us straight as a country? Why do we study history? Why is there, why is there an academic department in every university that attempts to explain what happened in the past? It's important. Unless we understand what happened in the past, we can't understand how we got to where we are today. If we have a faulty understanding of the past, our understanding of our present circumstances will be faulty as well. So that's why we study history. The old saying, those who do not study history are doomed to repeat it, is an old saying because it's true. You have to understand what happened or you're going to be making the same mistakes that were made in the past. Mistakes were made in the past. Mistakes are made today. How are they related? Unless we understand as simply as professional engineers, you go to school, you go to college, you go to university. They teach you subjects that are really nothing more than the compilation of all the studies and the experience of all the engineers that came before you in history. Why do they do that? Why not just start over fresh? Well, the reason why they do that is because there's a lot of lessons that were learned there. And those lessons, a lot of them were painful and they came out of failures. And in the effort to understand those failures, studies were made and a greater understanding of what was happening came out of that study 
and then things got better. The engineers that went forward from that point didn't make those same mistakes anymore because they were trained. They knew better. That's the process. If we think that steel frame buildings can be brought down by fires alone, and we go forward with that knowledge and that understanding, we're going to be doing things wrong. We don't think that's true. We think it flies in the face of all the reasons why engineers built steel frame buildings out of steel. If that isn't true, we've got a real problem. And unfortunately, right now, our professional organizations are turning a blind eye to this contradiction. And we can't allow that. As painful as it might be, as difficult as it might be to understand what really happened, we've got to face it. If we don't face it, there's more pain ahead. And literally, 9-11 opened the 21st century, and it seems as if it's a century that seems to be bound up in one catastrophe after the other. If it's not financial, it's political, it's military, it's technological. We have so many problems. We've got to deal with them. And we're not going to deal with them by hiding from the truth, no matter how painful it might be. Unfortunately, it would be nice if we could run away and stick our head in the sand and everything would just turn out fine. But that's not the way things work. When you run away and hide your head in the sand, things only get worse. So... That's what we're doing. That's why we call it Project Due Diligence. We're doing our due diligence, and we're doing our best to bring that word to our professional colleagues and to the public at large, and hopefully we can come to some sort of an understanding that we have to, we have to reinvestigate this matter. It's not a dead historical issue. It affects our future, and it has affected our present. Well, we're going to leave it there for now, but the book is called Engineering the 9-11 Cover-Up, How the World Trade Center Evidence Was Kept Secret from the World. We'll be talking a lot about that in the next coming months and year, and of course, we'll make that available when it's uh, finished and be sharing that far and wide. Roland, thank you for doing Project Due Diligence, taking up this project, and of course, for coming on 9-11 Freefall today. It's been my honor, Andy, to work with all of you and all the other engineers and the researchers that have collected this information and made this record. And we're going to take it now and make a hard copy out of it so that we can use it going forward.